When I was a little kid, I actually believed for a while and for quite some time, and even when I didn't believe it, I kind of fantasized about it. I believed that my life was a movie and it was being filmed somewhere, somehow, by someone. And that all the people in my life, even though they were parents and relatives, were actors, that actually came to fruition in my adult life when I saw The Truman Show with Jim Carrey. And I'm like, wow, I wasn't too far off. And every once in a while, I would think about that. My life is like a movie. Well, I mean, isn't it though? You've got drama, you've got comedy, you've got uh, happiness and sadness and heartbreak and joy. You have, you have scenes in your life that are award worthy and you have scenes in your life that are just, oh my God, who wrote this shit? but you act it out nonetheless, and you live your life to its fullest. Uh, I don't know where, where, the, where the first act is or where the second act may be in your life. It depends how long you live in your life. My question is, when's the sequel? <laughs> when I die? Is that the next thing? Is that the afterlife? Is that the sequel? So my question to you, ladies and gentlemen, is how's your movie? Hi, I'm Dino Tripodis, and welcome to Whiskey Business, a podcast not so much about whiskey as it is one with whiskey. And tonight, our guest bottle is, we, we go with another another local one, another local one from the High Bank Distillery. This is Whiskey War. Um, I believe that they got the name of the bottle uh, thanks to Henry Corbin, who back in the day... Uh, as you know, we've talked about this before, that the prohibition started right here in Ohio, in Westerville. And the High Bank Distillery is about 12 miles away from that fabled place. And uh, Henry Corbin opened up a saloon, a saloon that was blown up twice because there were people who did not want a saloon in that particular uh, part of Ohio. And um, it was blown up twice. And he actually addressed his protesters with uh, two pistols drawn. The first time he opened up the saloon, and that's when they say the whiskey war began, and that's when the uh, anti saloon league was established and, and prohibition was off and running. Now, in this particular case, I think the whiskey war that they're referring to is the fact that this particular whiskey is a blend of, of, of straight whiskeys and a nice blend, so the whiskeys are fighting it out in this bottle to please you. And I'm happy to say that it's, uh, you know what, there is peace in this bottle despite the battle that might be going on. It's got a high rye content, it's 86 proof, uh, it's not very expensive, I think it's about uh, 39 bucks a bottle. It's young, it's at least, here, you wanna take it, John Whitney, and, and show it properly? It's about, it, it's, it's been aged at least two years, so uh, uh, the longer you hang on to it, the, the better it's gonna get. But if you pick it up tomorrow and open it up the next day, you'll be good to go. So, hey, High Banks Distillery, congratulations on a fine product. I know you got some other uh, fine liquors as well, but I'm glad to see you're in the whiskey game. All right, Hansberry, before we get to our very special guest tonight, That's and I'm right. very excited about this guy because I've been trying to get him on the podcast for a long, 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 long time, and now seems perfect because he has a film that is streaming on Netflix as we speak. He's got other great films that you can see whenever you want to, but there's one that's kind of a hot topic right now. So speaking of hot topics, are, are, are we a hot topic? We're a hot topic right now um, because I'm going to hold up the sign here to be a little cheesy. That's, uh, you know, nothing. Thanks, John no, Whitney. No <laughs> expense has been spared. John Whitney, <laughs> thanks for whiskey business. This is DIY. Get it, getting the, getting the, some the, tape. Uh, it says uh, vote, Columbus Podcast Awards.com. We are, uh, have been nominated in the co comedy category yes, for the Columbus Podcast Awards. Uh, you can go there right now and voting uh, it continues throughout the month. Throughout of the month May. of May. Um, you can vote early and often, as we've, as we've been <laughs> the, saying. The Chicago way. So you can vote in the Columbus, uh, in the comedy category, but also for best overall podcast. Yes. You um, have to scroll down a little further to right. get to the final category there yep. for that one. Yeah. But, uh, you know, feel free to scour all the other episodes because we have a bunch of friends that uh, have been nominated in other categories. Yeah, there's a lot um, of great there's a lot of great podcasts that are out there and nominated. And all of them are, are really good. And, and uh so we, we strongly suggest that you check out our, our friends in the other categories as well and find something that might be to your liking, much like And the cool thing about it is business. they're all like right here out of Columbus. We talk a lot about it on this episode, some of the cool art and talent that we have right in our backyard. So uh, support the local scene too. Uh, also support us specifically, please, by uh, subscribing on iTunes. 
rate and review us. Maybe mm-hmm. you can give us a five star there and tell us what you like about us because that helps other people find us on on the podcasting apps and stuff. Um, uh, YouTube is uh, YouTube uh, whiskey business. You, whiskey Whitney. business with John. We're Whitney. at ninety nine subscribers. We need one more. Who's Who's be will that one hundred? Who will be the magical subscriber? 100th? Come on, But people. that's a lot of fun. We have uh, the unedited uh, video of this podcast. I really, enjoy, I really enjoy watching the unedited YouTube and then listening to your somewhat edited <laughs> yeah. audio. I mean, your audio obviously has been great for forever. I mean, but it's interesting what you what you choose I to... kind of polish up to, a little to, bit. To polish and take out a little bit. And a lot of the times, it's you. There's a lot of my sloppiness. <laughs> yeah, you know. It's you. Right. Well, uh, Instagram, uh, YouTube, or uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, you'll find us out there. And we always just say the grassroots effort helps a lot, too. Absolutely. I think that's what's got us to where we're at right now, honestly, is grassroots. And wait, right. Sorry, well, last thing before I know you want to get started. If you're watching the YouTube video... I these t- are two tall men in tall chairs, and I'm in a right. tiny little, uh, <laughs> tiny little stool here. So I look even shorter than normal. It's so my, thanks, guys. It's my uh, psychological right. attempt to minimize you. <laughs> <laughs> it's working. It's working. He's actually Benjamin Button over there. <laughs> it's very, it's getting smaller. It's getting smaller as we speak. <laughs> Extremely wicked, shockingly evil, and vile. No, not our guest and not our podcast, but it is the name of the movie that is currently streaming on Netflix, and our guest is actor Kevin McClatchy. He's more than just an actor. He's an actor. He's a teacher. He is, he's a giver. We'll get into that a little bit later on, but you play Ken Katsaris, the sheriff, the sheriff who, if you have any information or knowledge about the Ted Bundy uh, story, uh, Ken Katsaris was the sheriff who who pretty much put the nail in Bundy's coffin down in Florida. And Kevin McClatchy plays that sheriff in the movie. Welcome to the podcast, man. So glad to have finally had you. No, it's great yeah. to be here, man. So, Thanks, Dino. Thank Thanks. You so much. John, this is great. so good. Yeah, this is awesome. This is so cool. You play Ken Katsaris. I do. I remember when you texted me and told me that, hey, I'm playing Ken Katsaris, because Ken Katsaris, and we said this in last week's podcast, is from Steubenville, Ohio. Yeah. Oh, what the yes. fuck? Yes. He's from Steubenville. Are you Steubenville? Kidding? Yeah, yeah. no. Steub- I said yesterday, I said last <laughs> week in the podcast that Steubenville is the center of the universe. <laughs> and then, 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 right. then you, could, you could do six degrees That's of separation right. and come back to Steubenville with anything. And Ken Katsaris is from Steubenville. Yeah. He was a Greek guy, which I thought you were an interesting choice because if you, if you see pictures of Ken Katsaris, he's, he's not as uh, in, in, in shape as you. I, you know, and, I, and I said it in a complimentary fashion. He's a bigger guy. Yeah, he was, he, a, big he, he was a bigger guy and a bigger Greek guy. And then you know you got the the tall drink of water, Kevin McClatchy playing Kevin Katsaris playing a, a Greek sheriff. Yeah, that's like the long way around the barn of saying I look nothing like him. <laughs> <laughs> but I must but. say. You were rocking the sideburns, dude. That's, yes, that was rocking sideburns. the sideburns. Which I cannot grow. I cannot grow sideburns. Those so weren't yours. Those were not uh, mine. They, those man. were the magic of movie makeup. You wore them home, though, didn't you? Did I did. You know? oh, I kept them. I bought them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I bought them. I said I gotta have them. I gotta have them. Uh, so, what was it like making? You know, the, we seem to have a fascination. Uh, especially as of late with true crime. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's everybody. The people can't seem to get enough of it. And uh, the director, Joe uh, Berlinger, am I saying his last name right? Yes. Is, uh, also did the documentary, the, the Ted Bundy Tapes, which is also streaming on Netflix yeah. as we speak. Yep. So it's interesting that he did that and then transferred over into making this film, which does not deal with the killings per se right. or, the, or the method of, of Mr. Bundy's madness. Right. It, it takes a whole different tack. Yeah, it takes a whole different tack. It um, it starts uh, from the point of view of Ted's longtime girlfriend, Liz Kendall. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it's based on her book, um, A Stranger in My Bed. And that's where the first you know half of the movie is. It's the relationship between Ted and Liz and Liz's little girl. And uh, it's a, a, lot of, a lot of it is about the examination of how he got away with it for so long, especially with the people that were closest to him. Right. And that's, that's pretty fascinating, and there's no, uh, there's no recreations of the crimes. It's more about the relationships. It's about his relationship and his ability to manipulate and fool the people that were around him, to be exactly who he needed to be at any given time. And then it becomes about his relationship with, uh, with Carol, who is his former uh, co-worker, co-co-worker who comes back into the picture. And then it really becomes about his uh, relationship with the judge, right? which is really interesting, right? And so Liz gets a little, um, she gets put 
a little bit in the background, she's a spectator, you know, by necessity because it's the trial. But it really becomes about the relationship between uh, Ted and the judge. Right? Well, you the don't judge. see a lot of the judge. I'm sorry, yeah, interrupt. You don't John see a lot Malkovich of the judge. Plays the yeah. judge in the documentary. Yeah. You 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 see that 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 relationship being fostered a little bit more, yeah. and and they kind of they they kind of hint at it a little bit in in, in the film that mm -hmm. there was some camaraderie yeah. there between the two of them, yeah. especially at the end where he says, you know, I, I wish you would have gone a different path and you yeah. would have been a great lawyer. And yeah, so and he says, I have, uh, I have no animosity toward you. Right. I want you to know that, which is a, kind of an extraordinary thing for the mm -hmm. judge to tell. Uh, while, he's, while he's giving him the death penalty. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. And, uh, no, spoiler, sorry. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, Ted Bundy know. dies. Aww. That's right. Aww. That's right. God damn it. Yeah, it's, Thanos it's, dies. <laughs> <laughs> So that was, uh, that, I thought that was a really interesting way of telling the story. Yeah. And because um, a lot of people were hoping or expecting, maybe not hoping, but expecting a lot of uh, gore. Right. But it's really like anything you can conjure up in your imagination is going to be worse than what we can put on screen. Right. right. So we give the, or Joe gives the suggestion of it and sort of counts on people having a little bit of knowledge of Ted Bundy and the baggage that Ted Bundy brings, right? Yeah, and, right. And so going really into effective. this film, you, you probably, you, you know that he was a notorious serial yeah. killer and you know the body count and they say that, you know, I can't, I've lost count with over They 30, think it's between 30 and 100. 30 and 100. He confessed to, to 30. 30. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the only time you really see any violence from Ted Bundy is, is one shot towards the end of the film. You yeah. Know, where, where, yeah. Um, John Whitney and I were talking, and we, we both had the same question. We're curious, was there other things that you filmed as Sheriff Katsaris that were not in the movie? No. No. No, Every everything I shot was in the movie. And um, that was uh, that was great, first of all. It was awesome. I had two really, great really scenes. sort of memorable scenes, yes. script-wise memorable, and then yeah. it turned out... Uh, quite nice and then I was there as kind of impending doom during mm -hmm. the right. courtroom trial I cut away to you trial. occasionally yeah yeah because uh, it, and I, I, I don't mean to keep going back to the because I, I, I'm fascinated with, with true crime as well uh, given my earlier background but um, it was the it was the bite marks that kind of sealed Ted Bundy's fate and Sheriff Katsaris Ken Katsaris was was responsible for, for kind of putting all that together yeah. and, and sealing yeah. his fate and there's I I want you to watch the movie. I don't want to keep saying it, but there's a scene where, you know, they they go in there and open up his mouth, Ted yeah. Bundy's mouth and, yeah. and 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 get to it. And it was and that was uh that was the plan all along. For, uh, evidently that Ken would go in and uh, talk to Ted and sort of lay the law down, bring the hammer down. Mm -hmm. And then instantly the technicians come in and it's it's pretty aggressive. It's it, that's about as uh as aggressive physically aggressive as the movie gets until the very end. Yeah, because that, I, I, I knew, I, I kind of knew that's what they were going to do, but it, it, when, you, when you're when you watching the film, it looks like these guys are going, because he goes, because your character, you, you go in there and, and you kind of lay down the law, like you're in Florida now, yeah. and it, it, it almost looks like these guys are going to come in here and kick his ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Give him an ass, give him the Florida ass whooping, and then, but you know, they're going in for a different reason. But no, those are two great scenes. The one, uh, when you go into the cell with Zac Efron, and the press conference. Yeah. Or, you know, that, that's a great scene. Which is kind well. of an iconic uh, news footage moment. It is. Right? Yeah, that's, right. that's, that's an actual People of a certain age, moment. everybody of a certain age has, mm -hmm. has seen, seen that, that footage. Yeah. 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 So that was really sort of a surreal moment of recreating that mm -hmm. in a way, or, try, or Joe's interpretation of it, really. Right. Yeah. So, dude, when, when you take on a role, big or small, and, and let's let's go let's go with this one right now with with Katsaris. Uh, do you do research? Do you do any type of do you know? Do you, do you, did you find out anything about the man? How he was? Uh, uh, did you learn anything about him prior that that you put into your performance of him? I, I did, and I I, I tried every, every every time you do something like that, uh, it's a little different, and it just depends on what you see as the demands of the role. And with Ken Katsaris. Um, I was really interested in him because mm -hmm. this is the guy who finally was uh, the one to sort of bring everything together and get this guy. Right. And then the more I learned about him, he's an impressive guy. I mean, he has he's a, he's been an educator. He's been a leader in uh, law enforcement education as well as you know being a, obviously an iconic sheriff. And he was definitely ambitious. I mean, was I'm saying it like he's dead. He's still alive. Uh, and he was ambitious and. I think his ambition was such that it didn't get in his way. It just sort of got him 
to where he needed, he did everything he needed to do, and he was not going to be deterred. Right. Right. And some people, you know, saw him as a headline grabber, right? Because that was kind of unprecedented, having a press was, conference in public yeah. reading the indictment. Reading the indictment. That was and also not, not that was normal. Very odd, the first actually. court case that was actually televised, seen, televised yeah. as yeah. well. So, yeah. Because uh, they, I think they, they mentioned that he's actually running for sheriff at that yeah. particular time, yeah. right? In, in, yeah, he's up movie. for re-election. He's up for re-election. Yeah. So, yeah. so, yeah, I mean, uh, he's obviously ambitious, but, you know, uh, ambitious people often do great things, you right? You can't take that away from him. Uh, but he's yeah. a great guy, and his, uh, his daughter texted or sent me a Facebook message talking about how proud uh, she is of him and that he's this role model to her and you can mm -hmm. see why because he's done uh, kind of extraordinary things did you guys actually life. get to meet him i did not get to meet him um he did not know about this movie or that he was being portrayed in this movie until she told him <laughs> what did he not know after <laughs> i don't know, no, you know he's I, a I busy mean, guy like that, i yeah. said yeah it doesn't you know it doesn't deal with that with with the minutia of of how they caught ted bundy it's yeah. a, the, this particular movie is more about those relationships um but, you know, how would you, you, you know, you got to be in it at some point. And when you first told me about it, I got very excited. Because yeah. I thought, I thought, you know, it was going to be, I did not know that it was going to focus on, on the women in, in his life that he didn't kill. That he actually, yeah. you know, deceived and, and was able to, to court through the entire, throughout his entire, up, up to the end with, with, with Carol even. Yeah. I mean, you know, just amazingly so. Right. Uh, so I was, I, I was secretly hoping for more McClatchy. Yeah, I was I was uh, I was not so secretly hoping for more McClatchy, but it was it was great. And Zach and I talked a little bit uh, in those five or six days during the courtroom scenes that there were moments where he was grandstanding mm -hmm. and he would turn, and I was right there, just standing almost right behind him, but rows back, and it was almost like he was aware of I'm going to wriggle out of this, yeah, and you're going to watch, mm -hmm. and that was a cool layer. Right, yeah. it wasn't in the script, but it was part of what. So, as actors, did you guys use use each other during those moments? A little bit, the, yeah, a little bit, not too much, because he had uh, he was spinning, you know, six, seven plates yeah, with sure. all the other people. You know, Jim Parsons was the president. Jim Parsons, there. John Malkovich. It's, there's a lot. Jeffrey Donovan. There's Jeffrey, a lot of. Yeah. There's, there's a lot. Brian of great... Garrity, who's an amazing yeah. uh, actor. He played his first uh, defense oh, lawyer who yeah, quits right. memorably. Awesome. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, and uh, who who played the detective, the, the the Mike Phillips, the detective? Uh, Terry Kinney. Terry Kinney. The great yeah, Terry, yeah, Terry, Kinney. Terry Kinney. So we had Malkovich and Kinney on the same movie. They didn't have any scenes together, but no. two of the founders of Steppenwolf. Right. Right there. You know, and I got to spend six days, five days on the set with Malkovich, which was a dream come true. Yeah, so it was a dream I, yeah, come see, true. See, I, I kind of want to get into a little bit of yeah. that. Like, how, did, was were you disappointed? You know, sometimes when you when you meet heroes, when you meet your icons. icons he did not disappoint. He did not disappoint. He did not disappoint. He has this uh, reputation as a curmudgeon, right? Mm -hmm. Not at all. No. Not at all. He, uh, you know, on a film set, obviously there's tons of downtime and sure. everyone crowds around craft services, which was phenomenal. On this <laughs> not bad. Uh, the bagels. It was great. Yeah, it's just like Hoovering, Twizzlers, and the Chex Mix. No ramen noodles on no that. Ramen one. Noodles, no ramen noodles. No, no, no. On this one. They had, they had a little bit more of a budget. But I had to. Uh, I'll tell you. I had to figure out how I was going to approach Malkovich, right? Because I'll just tell you. When I moved to New York, I had never acted. I was nearly 25 years old. I had never acted in college or anything. I just quit my job, moved to New York. I had never seen a professional play. The first play I ever saw was a play by Lanford Wilson called Burn This, and Malkovich was the star. It was him and Joan Allen, and then uh, two, um, two great actors, Lou Libertor and Jonathan Hogan, but it was Joan Allen and What year Malkovich. is this, you think? 87. 87, because uh, I, I, rem I actually remember reading the review for yeah. Burn This in, in the New York And he Times. has this memorable, uh, his character, Pale, yeah. who's this coked up restaurant manager from Jersey, uh, he has this memorable entrance into this loft in, uh, in, in Tribeca. And he comes in and he has this like three and a half minute rant about trying to find a parking spot. <laughs> and Joan Allen's response is, I'm sorry, do I know you? <laughs> and an instant, and I've never seen it uh, since, it was an instant uh, eruption of a standing ovation for his entrance. Wow. And for wow. the next two and a half hours, man, it was scorched earth theater. And I was pinned to the back of my seat. And his performance is what kept me in New York. Because all right, because I wanted to ask you, uh, and this is maybe a good moment to, to to drift down this particular rabbit hole. 
I met you here in Columbus, Ohio, but you're from Los, Los Gatos, California. That's where you were born. I was born there, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that was, you know, six weeks later we moved to Philadelphia. Then you moved to Philadelphia. Yeah. You were in, in, in Haver, Havertown, PA. Yeah, Havertown, PA, yeah. Yeah, right? Havertown. Havertown. So you're, you're getting all James Lipton on uh, me now. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite word? Havertown, PA. So that makes right. you, uh, what, an Eagles fan? Yes. Oh, really? Yeah. Eagles. Yeah. Phillies, right? Fly, Phillies. Eagles, fly. Fly, Eagles fly, fighting Phils, the 1976ers, yeah. who are having a little bit of trouble right now. Come you, on. Ben you, Simmons, get a jump shot, dude. You love uh, Pete Rose for different reasons, because he brought a championship. I do. I do. I hated him. <laughs> <laughs> He's, it's like Bryce Harper has now taken on the Pete Rose role. That's right? right. That's right. Pete Rose, I hated him. Hated him as a Red. Hated him as a Red. Loved him as a Philly. Bryce Harper, hated him as a National. Love really, him now. I love him now, as long as he doesn't strike out too oh, much. Yeah. Wow. So you grow up in Havertown, PA, and no type of community theater or Nothing. anything like that when you're in Nothing. Havertown. You go to yeah. college, you become a journalism major. Yep. So you thought you were going to be a journalist? You were going to Yeah, I was I was uh, hoping to be the next Don Hewitt. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, that's that's lofty. Yeah, investigative journalism, sure. broadcast journalism, but I didn't even want to be in front of the camera. Hmm. No, I, I no desire. Yeah, no desire. Uh, but I always had the, like the thing to act. I just didn't have the wherewithal sort of like as a as a a creative artist I didn't I didn't really believe that that was something that I could do because mm -hmm. it really wasn't in my family except for my brother who's a musician so what possesses you to go to New York and see Malkovich in a, in a stage were, were you well I moved yeah I, I, I saw him after I moved but I was um, you know I was in college and you know you go to college sometimes you figure out who you are right right and uh, sometimes sometimes I did not <laughs> yeah sometimes you do and, and I did and I found out that I did not want to go into broadcast journalism mm -hmm. I did a uh, an internship my junior year for six weeks in New Haven. It was great. I, I lived at Yale, and then I worked at this radio, uh, TV station, and it was, was fun. But I didn't see myself doing that for the next 30, you know, 25, 30 years. Okay, and, and, so. and, and that's interesting because and I'm going to pay you a compliment, and you're a handsome man. I mean, when, when you're, you know, you are. I mean, you, I mean that's... You're a head, we're all this, four good-looking guys. Uh, you could deflect That's why we had to add YouTube, you know? You could know? deflect if you want. But it's all duct when, tape. when you think about network, <laughs> when you think about that's network right. anchors, when you think about the, you know, the, the you know nighttime news, uh, you know, the primetime, CBS, ABC, NBC, yeah. whatever, you, you've, you've got the classic stoic you could have been. You could have. You could have yeah, anchored the, the news. If the Tom Peter Brokaw Jennings good look. You could have. You could have. You could have. Peter Jennings easily. the hell out of that. You could have. Yeah. yeah. You could have. Yeah. For a long time, but yeah. you chose not to. Yeah, I chose not to. I, I just. Uh, I had a friend who was uh, who did theater in, in college. He was one of my roommates, and I clearly was in some kind of denial because I didn't go see his performances. I wouldn't go, for some reason. I just would find reasons not to. It's like I, I was playing basketball and I was a journalism uh, major. I was, was going to get stuff. into that too. You were also but, uh, an athlete, so we'll yeah. get into that in a second. But, uh, but go ahead. But he and I talked, and he moved to New York right after he graduated. He's a year older than me, and he he was just like, "Why don't you, why don't you just do it? Why are you not doing it?" Is what he kept saying. Why are you not doing it? And then I got to that point where I was kind of I was in a relationship, and it was at a point where either you're going to pop the question or the relationship is going to have to end, mm -hmm. and. That was a, a life mile post where it just made me realize, okay, if I'm going to do it, I got to do it. And it's like I couldn't not go. So I just quit my job in Philly and uh, moved to New York. And luckily I had four buddies from college who had a huge brownstone on 92nd Street. Nice. And they gave me a closet. Nice. Seriously, I, I let go of my mattress mm -hmm. and it, at an angle. It didn't even go all the way down. <laughs> oh, so no. I, I slept on an angle for the first six months, and then finally I graduated to uh, a room. A room. Yeah. Uh, which but it, is huge in New York. Yeah. Yeah. But it was Maybe awesome. It was terrifying. And um, so what's the first thing that you did as a, in your, in your opinion, as a professional actor? Was it as, stage or was it? Was as, it a, as a professional, um, and we'll, see, we'll call it professional, like getting paid yeah. cash money. Sure. So I did a lot of theater and sort of give it away for free with theater companies uh, which was fine with me because I had no idea what I was doing. You were learning. So, yeah, I had got on stage and did uh, a lot of theater and made a lot of friends. What was the first thing you did on stage as a, in theater? <laughs> the very first yeah, thing, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was in a play and I was, uh, first I was the headlight of a car. <laughs> nice. Yeah. My whole family, you can imagine, my whole family, goes, okay, Kevin, 
quit his sports marketing job. He moved to New York, and now he's an actor. They come and see me, you're and I'm a headlight. You're a headlight. In the At car. least you're wearing my a tree. My brother, my brother Trip, my older, oldest brother Trip. He's like, dude. Did you, like, did you method that? Did you, I did. did. Did you method that role? I, I crawled inside <laughs> a, an abandoned Maserati. And I was like, how does this work? How does this work? I turn on. I turn off. I turn on. I turn off. The headlight, am I different, am I different when they put the brights on and they go back to regular? Right. Do I change? Am I affected by the turn signal or do I ignore exactly. that? Yeah. So McClatchy shines. Uh, but, it was, yeah. but it was weird experimental theater and I was just, I was thrilled. I, yeah. I, I, I didn't want to be anywhere else. But the first professional job was on uh, Guiding Light in there 1993. There we go. We're getting into the soap yeah. operas, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. So Guiding Light was um, Guiding Light was incredible. I had uh, I had gotten you know as you do you so like you take class and then I started auditioning for stuff and I got a manager and I got an agent. You just started making your way. You know everybody's got their story of how they get that. Uh, sure. And I went in and I uh, read for a contract role at Guiding Light and it was me and four like Adonis's, right? So it was like four dudes that were just amazingly beautiful. And then there's like pasty white Irish guy. And I was like, which one of these things is not like the other? With pasty white yeah. Irish guy. So I, I gave the screen test and it went great. And um, I was leaving and the executive producer, wonderful woman named Jill Farron Phelps, she, uh, she said, we'll be seeing you again. And I, you know, and I was like, yeah, okay. pull this leg, it plays Jingle Bells, right? So right. I was like, what, 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 do you, what do you mean? <laughs> and she was true to her word. I didn't get that role, but they wrote a role for me. And I came back uh, three months later, and I had this memorable, vicious arc as a, uh, as a racist uh, sexual predator. Wow. Guiding Light. Yeah, okay. That was kind of the start of it. Uh -huh. You were you did Guiding Light. You did another Family world. Stuff. Another world. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that was world. yeah. That was I was on that one for two years. That mm -hmm. was the big contract. That was girl. a big contract. Yeah. And you had like a, a a one shot on Young and the Restless. Yeah, Young and the Restless was uh, that was like one day, and uh, it was a thing where somebody was going to do it, and then they dropped out. And I was in Los Angeles, and they asked me to come in and read, and they're like, "Do you want to do it?" And I was like, "Yeah, I'll do it." Because <laughs> they, I mean, they knew who I was at that point. And at that I, point, the Young and the Restless. I mean, Young and the Restless is still one of the few soaps that's still on. Yeah, right. Now. Yeah, and that was the mo at that point. It was the most. You know, it was the, it was the number the one. one. It was, so it was huge. there used to be twelve, and I think there's four now. Mm, yeah, I'm not. Maybe? I know. I know that yeah. there's. Yeah, I don't know what all, what is yeah. all. I know Bold and the Beautiful. The only reason I know Bold and the Beautiful is on because that's the number one soap opera in Greece. Don't yeah. ask me why. Yeah. it is. It always has been. Uh, and Young and the Restless is before yeah. that. What are, need, uh, what are the to, days like that uh, on that kind of schedule? Do you have time to do plays in the evening or? Yeah, sort of, yeah, yeah. I mean, the short answer is yeah, because if you're doing plays, you're usually rehearsing at night. Unless you're on Broadway, mm -hmm. then it's different. Then you can carve out, uh, people do that. Like, there's a guy named Larry Brigman who was on As the World Turns and he was, uh, he just won a couple of Tonys. He won a couple of Tonys. He was, he's Al Pacino's best buddy. And he, his day job, was as the world turns, and then he would go do Broadway, right? And they would just carve out the time for him to rehearse and uh, and do his thing and do films. So it's possible, but the days are pretty long. Did you have yeah. an opportunity, especially with the with the longer contract on Another World, to pretty much, you know, make that gig last forever? Did or or did it just run out? Did you was it your conscious choice to? move on or uh no, no. Uh, it was uh, two years it was the end and they were they were like uh jill farron phelps was the one who um she was the executive producer at guiding light and then the way it, it's kind of like baseball managers and, right. and basketball coaches that once you pierce that community you get canned at one place you move on to another. Up. i've seen it yeah so she got fired at guiding light and she went to another world and the first thing she did was hire me to replace a guy uh, named Justin Chambers, who's been on Grey's Anatomy for like, ever, forever, yeah, yeah. the whole and, on yeah, and I, I don't know why they wanted to uh, let him go. Good for Justin. Yeah, yeah, he good moved for Justin. On, yeah, he, he moved on to something. Yeah, and I, cool. I don't know him, never met him, uh, but obviously he's doing phenomenally. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, so if you would have had the opportunity to stay for as long as they wanted you, would you? Would, I'm I'm curious about that in the yeah, in, that's kind in of, that's that professional a, world. No, that's a great question. You got the gig. Yeah, you know, and like yeah. You know, I was in radio 24 years, left, and then, you know, yeah. if you 
you're on a soap opera for two years and they offer you another contract for another two do you do you keep them you stay you keep the money you're being oh, yeah, you're working of, you're working working absolutely. actor absolutely and it's a it's a really really difficult decision with another world jill got fired and then they let go th three of the people that she hired and i was one of them right after mm -hmm. so i was just right at the end of my second year the mm -hmm. two-year contract right so How'd so, you go out, if you mind me asking? Do you have a cool, like, falling down the elevator shaft No, scene? man, no. That was it. No, you just it weren't just, on anymore. Yeah, it just wrote you out. Oh, come it on. came full circle, because when I took over for that guy, Justin, <laughs> he was in a hospital bed one day. The next day, it was me. <laughs> That's right? so and weird. I think the same thing happened, right? Because some other dude came in after me. After you. And I had... That's uh, the way it happens. I'm going out for cigarettes. <laughs> yeah. <I> mean, <laughs> he, never, uh, he never came back. What was Brad Pitt? Brad Pitt walked into a bathroom and just never came never, out. Never this came out. Never right? came out. Right, right, right. Yeah. Died That's like hysterical. Elvis, I guess. Uh, there you but go. On right the after that, Lisa, my wife Lisa and I talked to... We were like, yeah, this is great money. This is mm -hmm. great money. And then a couple of opportunities came up right after that. And I was, it was a tough, it's a really tough decision to either go back and audition for another contract, right? right. And, and go back into and, that. And stay in that world. Yeah. And I did it. I auditioned for one contract role right after that. And then I went in and uh, talked to Lisa and I talked to the, the, my managers. And I, I was like, I don't know that. I, I guess I could see myself doing that for another few years, but it's a it's kind of a frustrating thing. And I was I was I was starting to learn that it was just the nature of that work is it kind of it's incredibly frustrating because it goes so fast. I was gonna say it goes fast. So does it dull? Does it dull your? It, it makes you have bad habits. Is the okay. best way uh, I could I can describe it. My question was if if, if you are consider yourself to be at any point at the, at the top of your game and you're doing a soap opera which goes fast and and, yeah. moves, and you got a lot of lines and you know you're on tv every day um talent wise are you are you, do, do you ever catch did you ever catch yourself just kind of like not phoning it in but working at working at a at, at, at half of what you're capable I, of just I, to get through i didn't uh i didn't you i committed all the way through i, I did because it was the um it was so new to me, mm -hmm. right? And so you wanted to, you were you were bringing your A game every time. Trying step of to, the yeah, way. you tried to, because a lot of it's you like, wanted a daytime Emmy. You wanted a daytime. <laughs> I did Emmy. want a daytime. You Emmy. wanted a daytime Emmy, <laughs> goddamn it! I, I, I never got within <laughs> spitting distance of a daytime Emmy, but I did want one. But uh, I think it's a lot of it's like improv. Yeah, and it's kind of close to live theater because it's three cameras, and they're not really going to cut and pick up in the middle of a scene unless somebody screws up. So you're getting through the whole scene, and if you get it once, it's like, all right, we're moving we're on. We're moving on, yeah. And so it was great training, great camera training, because you had to make bold choices, quick, strong choices, and just go. So did, did working in the soaps make you a stronger actor? It, to a certain extent, uh, camera-wise, yes. Yes. But then you're also taking shortcuts just out of survival, gotcha. which you then have to kind of undo a little bit and, get, and, and sort of get back to where you can be uh, a little more effective. So you leave the you leave the soaps, but then you, you score some good gigs. I mean, love and other drugs. That's that's mm -hmm. your Anne Hathaway's boyfriend. Yeah, yeah. And love was, and other drugs. Yeah, that was fun. That was uh, I shot um, I shot like four different scenes, but just just the one was in there because mm -hmm. it was it was a gigantic script. It was huge. I mean, it was. I mean, it was, it was three hours on the page. Mm -hmm. And so they obviously had to cut right. some things. And there was a guy, there was a character who was um, her best friend. The guy's like her best friend, co-worker in the coffee bar where she works. That dude, that actor, must have, he must have shot like 12, 14 scenes. And he's in two or three mm -hmm. in the final thing. It just just happened. But it was, it was incredible. Yeah. Wasn't it with Anne Hathaway, Jake Gyllenhaal, yeah. Ed Zwick, Oliver Platt. I, I mean, once again, you, yeah. you've, 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 You've managed to surround yourself in, in certain roles with with, with great people. Uh, Unstoppable with uh, with uh, Denzel Washington. You know, you're in that movie. Yeah. Robert Redford more recently. Old Man and the Gun. Yeah. Casey Affleck. Yeah. Uh, he was he yeah. was um, okay. he was really fun to work with. But the guy on Unstoppable, the guy that was uh, was incredible is Kevin Dunn. Now Kevin Dunn is on Veep. Mm -hmm. He's uh, he was. He was in the Transformers movies. He played Shia LaBeouf. Yeah, yeah, he's he's just, he's mm -hmm. been in everything, mm -hmm. and uh, he's ah. a he's a master. 
He's just a master, and he, uh, he played my boss in Unstoppable. Yeah, he was. Good. He's one of those utility yeah. Yeah. character that you see him pop up in a, in a variety of roles, but great. everything he's yeah, in. He's yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, he's yeah, great. He he's great. He's great. Yeah, I just he's showed great my, in Veep. Yeah, he's great in Veep. I just showed my daughter uh, Dave, Kevin Klein, and yeah. Frank Langella, and, yeah. and yeah. Kevin Dunn. Yeah, and he's he's incredible. And he was so much fun. He's he's got this crazy sense of humor. Which was a big surprise because he comes off as a little bit of like a gruff mm -hmm. Chicago guy, but he, he's an awesome, awesome individual. So you, I mean, you continue to do, and you know, we we mentioned the the soap opera work, but there were appearances on NCIS, uh, X Files. Yeah. Um, uh, My favorite appearance of all time. X Files. On X Files. Yeah, I mean, I mean, <laughs> what you, was your? You, uh... you you got appearances on on shows. When they were hot shows. Yeah, yeah, it was. I was lucky that way. Like so ER, me, ER was the number one. Yeah, you were on, on, on an early episode show of ER, and, 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 and then X Files was the number one show when it. When right, I was on you were. It. You he were was on in the pre credit uh, pre credit tease too. He was in the in that first X Files segment before the. Tease. Something crazy uh -huh. happened to you. Yeah. I gotta know what. Just he give got me the axe. Oh, X Files. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got, yeah. I got nice. I got an axe in the head from. Yeah, uh, cool. Uh, a man with three eyes, like right. like well, yeah. that, like I you mean, do on that happens a lot. Yeah. Happens. Yeah. That's my favorite okay. set photo too, because I was reading the paper, and I had this huge <laughs> thing that's like corn syrup and bacon bits. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I'm reading the bacon paper, bits. and somebody took a Polaroid of me. Nice, yeah. a Polaroid. So, kind of like the uh, what is it, Boris Karloff drinking tea? <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's kind of that bit. Yeah. So, um, cause there's, bacon I, I wanna, bits. there's so many things I want to get in, <laughs> yeah. into here. Bacon bits. And then I'll just tell you this. Sorry. It was bacon, sorry. It was bacon bits and corn syrup. And we were shooting in Koreatown in LA and we had to walk from makeup. It was about a three block walk to this freaky old house. Sure. Yeah. And the makeup artist said, I'm going to bet you I'll go over under. Over under <laughs> of six people asking you if you need an aspirin because of your headache. <laughs> And eight people asked me. It was incredible. It was like, I was like, yeah, the splitting <laughs> headache. The yes, worst thank joke you. Ever, and everybody's <laughs> asking. Everybody's yeah. asking. He gripped me. I'll also <laughs> say that it was, it was playoff season. It was October, and uh, football Robert, playoffs. Baseball. Or baseball playoffs. And it was uh, Robert Patrick had just started, and the Mets and Yankees were playing, and we're at this house, and they had a couple of monitors, but they didn't have any reception. Robert Patrick hoofed it back to his trailer. They undid the direct TV, hoofed it back, set it up so we could all watch the. And that he way. did it. He didn't send anybody. He didn't to send go. anybody. He went on his he own. He went and did it. Robert Patrick, stand up dude. And, 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 yeah. and impressed you. It that, did, with man. The, with that move yeah. right there. Absolutely. Could have sent somebody. Could have sent somebody. I got a guy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I got a guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, Hansberry, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm looking at the clock. I'm probably going to go over, and telling you, John Whitney, as well, I'm probably going to go over an hour. Would you do two parter? I only uh, have two uh, fingers that get tired when I have to work that <laughs> I understand. I understand. Well, I'm not going <laughs> to much past yeah. an hour, but there's so many things I got I to gotta ask okay. Kevin McClatchy here. Don't worry about it. Here. This is a good one. I'm just, uh, um, so why you're doing all these roles, because I, I want to get to where you are. Now, which is still a working actor, but you split your time in so many different directions, and we'll get to those in just a second. Why you were doing this before? Did, did you? Ever, was there any one of these roles, be it the soap operas or uh, on stage, where you thought, you know, this is the one, especially on television, you know, uh, this is the one that's good, that someone's the right person is going to see me, and 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 take me even further up this up this ladder of you know yeah, success yeah. because you're a working actor and when you look at the whole spectrum of 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 sag actors there's not a lot of them that work you work yeah i i do i work um, you work consistently which is huge yeah i i guess consistently and it's all relative really right because i i work consistently compared to most a, a large portion most of the, of the you're union being kind. Yeah. you're being yeah. kind but I mean, it's a good, really great question about was there one role, and I, I, I don't know if there was one. Um, maybe uh, I'm Anne Hathaway's boyfriend. This is the one that's going to yeah, put me over. But you know, to, to be honest, that's that, that's one brief moment, I, and it's I not know. it's I not know. really. Uh, Asking me to do a lot. I understand. You know, I think she did win a Skinatomy award for that uh, for that Skinatomy? movie. Yeah. Skinatomy. Yeah, that's the Mr. Skin nudity awards. <laughs> I'm, I'm not making. Why this do you know that, Hansberry? You don't want to know. Because he's he's 12. That's why he knows. Skinatomy. Yeah, the Skinatomy he's, awards. Skinatomy yeah. awards. He's 12. Yeah. He awards. He's 12 years old. Nudity Despite the beard. Despite the beard and the mustache 12. and the fact that he has two small children. 
he's 12. Yeah. He knows skin out of me. But, I think, <laughs> but we digress. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I think the ones that were, uh, I think a better way maybe to, because I think the answer is probably no. No. Term, like, I don't think there was one where I thought, okay, this is the one. This is the I one. I think with Another World, uh, I think, frankly, when we were doing Guiding Light, I was working with mostly with uh, this incredible actor, his name's Monty Sharp, and with uh, Neil Long, who was in Boys in the Hood mm -hmm. and Are We There Yet? All those. Right. And I thought, man, this is this is different than what most soap opera stuff is. I mean, this is raw. I mean, this is brutal. And I thought, wow, this is this is something that is unexpected. And then when I did NCIS, that was such a cool episode. And I knew that the other guest star was uh, Terry O'Quinn. Terry O'Quinn, yeah. Well, John Lott from, 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 Lost. from Lost. Yeah. And I thought, man, this is yeah. You're you're this one is really really interesting. But and you're on a you're on the on on a number one show. Yeah, yeah. As no, well, a number one show where, where kajillions of people are watching. Yeah. So I I think um, but each of those are sort of great, uh, interesting guest roles. And I don't I don't think. Uh, I don't. I guess some people look at it like, "Oh, this is the one." Mm -hmm. I, I haven't really looked at it that way. You just look at it as this is the next one. Yeah, I've looked at it that way uh, for myself in theater. Mm -hmm. So there are roles where I think, "Okay, not that this is going to get me noticed, but this is really pushing me to to really find my capacity and w what's possible for me as an actor," which I think is 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 a more it's a more useful, uh, profound question. And that sounds like... No, 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 it, no not at all. But not it's the one that has legs. Not at all. Because the other stuff isn't up to me. Because I find it very interesting that this guy, Kevin McClatchy, who didn't want to go see his friend yeah. in a play for whatever reasons, and, and studied journalism and thought he was going to be a broadcast journalist of some sort, they had no inkling of going into theater or acting is now the head of acting and director as a professor at OSU. Yeah, yeah. So don't you, don't you sometimes kind of chuckle at the irony of that? A little bit, yeah, I do. It, and I, I don't know, I don't know how to explain it, except that I always wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. it, I always wanted to do it. We were, I would watch movies all the time. I was obsessed with movies from as as as, as young as I can remember. As but was I? You held up a. I have a DVD in it. Uh, a friend oh, returned to me. Yeah. I have a DVD of Serpico with Al Pacino, and you yeah. held it up and said, "This is what made me want to be an actor." Yeah, it was a the movie first, actor. First, you know, quote unquote, yeah. dramatic, right. serious movie that I remember seeing. And mm -hmm. you know, Al Pacino. I was like, man, that is something that I think I could do. But that what, would be real. Not that I could do what he does, but, yeah, oh, but you, that would you, be... You totally could do what That he would be does. amazing to be able to have that effect. And the same thing happened when I saw Malkovich and Burn This. I was like, right. if I could do that to an audience, what he's doing to me, then all the stuff that I have to go through to do okay. that is going to be worth I'm gonna, it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to just divert for one quick second because I want to come back to what I started here with the, uh, the acting and directing. Yeah. You, you have. You've done exceptional well received theater here in columbus uh -huh. as well you've you, you've done you've done powerful theater here you know you have you've gotten well reviewed you've yeah, gotten great yeah, reviews yeah. you've done incredible work now are, are you belittling it because it's not on broadway like john malkovich and burn this not at all not at all you know you've done good work i'm not belittling no i'm not belittling anything i mean i don't think so, i don't so, think talent is geographical at all i mean it's something i learned pretty quickly when i right. came here when I first moved here, I was wondering what, what it was that I was going to do. Right. And then I started to meet people here and, uh, and teach a class, you know, teach in the community and then do get involved in a couple of theater companies. And it's clear. I mean, the an answer is obvious right. to everyone else, obviously, except me when I moved here, <laughs> that talent is it's not geographical. Not it's geographical. like people are just here and there's incredibly talented people here. And I had, uh, Amazing. I've had incredible, you know, I've had great opportunities here. Played Mark Rothko in Red, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it was, I'd never get cast as Mark Rothko in New York or Chicago or LA. Never. But you would here. But I did here, and it was, uh, and, and, it was a phenomenal don't you think, experience. Though, don't you think, though, you could have there if you were, if, if, if the opportunity existed? Maybe. Probably. But it, but it took somebody 
it took uh, it took somebody who uh, took the director Jimmy Bohr to say I think you could do this role even though you're absolutely not the right physical type or mm-hmm. or any other type much like Ken Katsaris and yeah <laughs> but it was, a, it was a, that was an opportunity much, to much trans- like much like you're not a big happy yeah. Greek guy that's right with, with, with jet black hair yeah. and and uh, sultry eyebrows right <laughs> sultry <laughs> sultry eyebrows is that is that what you, a, yeah they, they were you know what we they were kind of sultry, sultry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but sometimes you get a chance to to transform right <laughs> right, so you right. Get a yeah. John Whitney sure, sure, sure. and eyebrows. that's really exciting yeah so I don't belittle any of the work because it's in Columbus. So now you, so you're the, you're a professor. You're head of acting and directing at OSU. Now yeah. you get to give back. Yeah, yeah. Teaching is. Uh, Have you found that rewarding? Hugely, yeah. It's. Uh, I mean, it's, it was the main reason I went back to get my grad mm-hmm. education. You get my MFA at you know 46 years old because I wanted the at least the opportunity or the option to teach in an academic setting. Let me ask you a couple questions about teaching. Okay, because I'm very curious. Can you make, if somebody comes to you, yes, and they're bad, they're just a bad actor. Yeah. Can you make a bad actor better? Yes. Through your teaching? Yes. Can you make them a really good actor? I don't know, but you can absolutely make them better. Make them better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you what 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 do you what do you look for in a like? Okay, you're a mess. But here's, <laughs> but here's, but yeah, you know, maybe you don't say that to them. But what do right. you, what do you, what do you look for to find a mine, if you will, as a, as a teacher and an educator yeah. to to help them get to that to that next level, that yeah. better level. No, Is that's it something a, within within them. Yeah, it's a great question, and I think it, it goes right to the um, to what the artistry of being a teacher is. Like if there if there's artistry to being a teacher, especially there is, especially um, someone. In a performance, the craft. Yeah, whether it's a dance teacher or an acting teacher or a singing, uh, with actors, you you have to identify what that particular individual needs, uh-huh. which would be different. Like what Dino might need to grow would be completely different from what John might need, and to be able to divine that and then create opportunities to help them uh, grow in that little you know, fertile soil. Mm-hmm. That's, that's sort of the artistry of teaching. And that's, that's what I, I find, you know, endlessly exciting because it changes with every individual that you come across. Do you get excited when you come across a student or a fellow actor that has natural God given talent? Oh my God. Yeah. What do you do then? I mean, how do you, how do you shape, how, how do you shape and, 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 and mine it and not, you know, not like, screw it up. Not screw it yeah, up. Really. Yeah, yeah. So th- every acting teacher would be different, right? Some people believe in even even if someone has um, incredible natural ability, mm-hmm. that I'm going to break you down <laughs> and build you back up the way I want you to be an actor. Right. No. I take the exact opposite approach. Good. Because the only reason for anybody to take a, a, a studio acting class is to find their own way of working, not my way. Mm-hmm. Because some elements that I may offer you may work for you, some of them may not. But in the exploration of all the different opportunities to investigate something, you start to figure out your own way of working. Because when you leave, and that's the goal, is to leave and to not need instruction or someone to hold your hand anymore. When you leave and you go into rehearsal, you go on the set, then it's you. And you're, you're this uh, self-sufficient, productive member of the acting mm-hmm. uh, society. So you can add your little chip to this storytelling in, a, in the most effective way. So finding their own way of going and finding the right scene to challenge somebody with. When to push them. When to uh, support them pull back even. yeah when to get out of their way and let them uh screw it up and then say okay now let's assess Do, can yeah. can actors in in who you teach can uh they they, they can learn from their failures right you it, it, that's all it is it's all, that's all it is you learn from messing it up from screwing it up and then you fail better the next but, time uh, but there's not a lot of professions where if you if if you fuck up you get another shot you know, in, in, in other worlds, you fuck up at your job, you're fired. Yeah, but you, it, you fuck up in yeah. acting, you you might get fired from that job or not yeah. or, or not get that job. Yeah. But you have a chance to. Well, when when we t- when you talk about fucking up, it's it's it, again, it's like degrees, right? Right. So if you go in, I, I bring in this bold, vivid, specific 
choice for this character. Mm -hmm. And we do a take, right? And if John Whitney's directing it, he's like, yeah, Kevin, that was <laughs> very clear and specific, but don't ever do that again, right? Okay. <laughs> Let's do I something I would never else. use that language, actually. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Like shape up, fucker. Uh, that's right. <laughs> could, you, could you not suck this time? Yeah. yeah. So then Funny. he would give me an adjustment, say, well, how about this? And then I would have to have the wherewithal to adjust. And if I can't do that, then I have to assess, okay, what, what is it that's keeping me from being able to fulfill the demands of a perfectly legitimate direction? What is it? Is there something, am I holding on to something too tight? I am, I too, do I, am I too invested in making it perfect or right? And that's the thing, there's no right. There's no perfect. And that's what happens to young actors especially. They think there's a right way to create a role. There isn't. There isn't. There's I like your that a way. lot of a lot yeah. across the board. See, I this like is, that. This, yeah. this is good because, yeah. uh, and I'm glad you you brought John into it because, um, you 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 teach acting and and and, and directing at, at OSU, and then you get hired by Joe Berlinger to do this movie. Yeah. You were thankfully uh, in our movie. You played Jerry, the sleazy landlord in the street where we live. John Whitney directed that. That's right. Irredeemable scuzzballs. That's, that's why I have a sag card. <laughs> <laughs> like, we have a complete uh, unsalvageable have a reprobate. Get McClatchy. Get McClatchy. <laughs> no, we, no. We don't have to audition. No, we'll just, it's we'll interesting. When we were discussing yeah. this, you know, he had, he, had the, he had the landlord pictured as some fat, sleazy guy that, you know, was looking yeah. for every opportunity he could yeah. Uh, yeah. to score. And I said, no, it needs to be a good looking guy that that you know if he didn't right. if he didn't need he did he did he doesn't need to use the rent as manipulation he could he could have scored this chick naturally if yeah. he wanted to yeah. but yeah. despite the fact he still uses that as a as a tool and i you know that's when that's when you came yeah, into that play. point is like who could we get who could handle the material and we won't have to worry about it yeah and but oh, but, yeah, but my yeah, question yeah, is yeah, my, question is, God, so. Kevin, my question is my question is do you do, do <laughs> how much do you trust a director, right? Yeah, and when when and, and and when you have a conflict with a director's giving you some advice, yeah, and you now as a as a as a teacher and 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 going with your natural instincts is what you think. I mean, do you debate the director? Do you discuss it? Do you come to a happy medium, or do you just suck it up and say, oh, okay, I'll try it your way? The answer is all of the above. All of the above, and it depends on the set. Right, so right. if it's John, and John and I are, are working on something, right, and we're like, I, I think this, and John thinks that, with John, we can have a conversation. Right. But ultimately, it's a director, a director's medium. It's, it's an editor's medium, right? And I am, as the actor, I'm, in effect, assistant storyteller, mm -hmm. right? And the story that's being told is being told by the director, right? So... At that point, I either say, okay, I'll do that, or then I have to make a decision, do I want to keep doing this? Mm -hmm. Is it unsalvageable? And that's, that's usually rare. I mean, it happens, obviously. But it depends. You know? So with Joe Berlinger, uh, he is a documentary filmmaker, and this, I think, is his second narrative film, right? And mm -hmm. he, had, he had very specific... Uh, ideas about the scene and Zach had specific ideas about that scene in the jail cell and the and the press conference and we talked about it but we just happened to be on the same page and so at that point Joe as a savvy director just sort of got out of the way of a few takes after giving a couple of you know just physical uh, suggestions and that gives you the confidence you're like okay cool this guy who I just it. met. I mean, yeah. I auditioned for him, but now I'm on the set for him. The first day I'm on the set, he trusts me. Sweet, I can relax. Uh, how how important is trust? It's I mean, in in both theater. It's all and, important and in film. It's all important because if you don't trust the person who is the only outside eye, <clears throat> then you're kind of swimming by yourself, which is fine if you you know if, if you have a if you have a, hand, a solid handle on it, but mm -hmm. everyone can benefit from the outside eye. The, John's going to see something that I can't possibly see because I'm in it. Because but you're in it. And if I don't trust him, then... And the, and the, 
I'll mm-hmm. get back in front of the camera and I'll be I'll be like half in and half out. Who has the object? Who has the objectivity at that point? The director? Well, nobody has the objectivity. They just have opinions. Opinions. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, no one. There. There is no objectivity. But in, going, in any of this. Going back to trust, though. It's. I mean, it's storytelling. So yeah. it's. John thinks this is the best way to tell the mm-hmm. story. There is no best way to tell it. John That's has his way. idea of what it is. Right. And hopefully that and, dovetails and, and, with this And the screenwriter probably has an idea as well. Yeah, well, that and, scene we did with Christina, we had, there, yeah. was, there, was the, there were the words on the page, and then those words on the page went away. It wasn't away. right. Because we were trying to figure out how best to tell the story. Right. Yeah. And that's the thing about trust is that when you, when, you have, when you cast somebody, especially the director always has the last say when they cast somebody. So, you know, and you're in, that, in the Bundy film, he cast you for a reason because he thought you were you were a good fit, right? Yeah. And I think you're a good fit. So there's that trust. Right. So then you can work with that actor, and you can trust you trust that actor to tell the story the way you want to tell it. In that situation with Christina's scene, uh, the scene wasn't perfect, and I knew that it wasn't quite right. And I said, "We're gonna toss this. We're gonna toss these pages out. Let's yeah. just work through this." And, and, and that, we, in that's rehearsal, where, it and, was and great. that's where it, it, and it that's and where it becomes. Yeah, uh, I would argue becomes the most rewarding, right? Because now it's this collaborative art form, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. In the, exactly, at the point of contact. Yeah, well, sorry yeah. to interrupt. That's it, it goes both ways because you owe these guys just as much for the final Absolutely. product sure. as, as, as yeah. It yeah. both yeah. ways. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that and, scene was written not, by yeah. Christina and 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 Kevin, for, basically for, for the most part. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, it's all, it's all we, we're all sort of rowing in the yeah. same direction. We, Absolutely, we, yeah. we kind of set that stage in that moment what it wanted to be, and you guys worked it out yourselves, and that was a great thing. I mean, I don't, I'm not blowing smoke up your ass when I say this. We were thrilled to have you on street uh behind you is a poster minus one that john osbeck always gets excited about because every time we youtube the podcast yeah, yeah. yeah that's always sitting in the background yeah, but you were in that one as well yeah. i'll cross and, osbeck's and, name uh, off I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna put i'm gonna put a little piece of tape over osbeck's name <laughs> so but i'll never Kevin see it is in that film that we shot some yeah, yeah. seven eight nine yeah, yeah. years ago as yeah, well yeah. and a small part yeah. but 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 you know an important part yeah it was fun i mean you you really you're very generous in that yeah. you came on on our film Mm -hmm. you came in on john's film and then you're doing these films as well yeah yeah, yeah. you know you're doing these big you you know you're working with robert redford you're you're working with zach Efron, who by the way a side note before i get into my next question here because it's an important one is he dreamy he is dreamy he's dreamy dreamy. zach efron pretty dreamy dreamy. yeah that's a creepy (laughs) dude really well too he plays a a serial killer really well too he he, he murdered those 30 women he was great and Hey, he gives a great performance, right? He, he does. Gives a he really, really does. Great performance, and he had so much skin in the game, right? Uh, you know, his production company was part of uh, making this happen, and this is, you know, kind of his shot at the title, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? And when that happens, it's uh, the star kind of sets the tone on the set. Sure. And he handled himself uh, impeccably. I mean, he had so much pressure and so much responsibility Mm -hmm. and he's in just about every scene and uh, he was uh, he was flawlessly amiable uh, recognizing every single person cast crew Uh, he's he just handled himself uh, I was I was endlessly impressed with him when I really good to hear when I first started watching the movie I saw Zac Efron playing Ted Bundy but as the movie went on he became eerily very similar looking to Ted Bundy he's creepy dude especially when at the when they roll the end credits I wanted to fuck him you still have the fresh you still (laughs) you still have the fresh take his mic away you still have the fresh image of Zach as Ted Bundy, and then they yeah. show that documentary footage, you know, in the yeah. in the in the credits at the end. And you're like, yeah. wow, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he yeah, yeah. He, mm-hmm. he 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 nailed the charismatic, charming part of Ted Bundy that Absolutely. we hear about and see yep. in the documentaries. But when you see it in a narrative uh, uh, translation on film yeah. like that, he yeah, he did a great job. Yeah, and it's essential. It's essential it's because huge. he Ted had groupies at. At, at the trial. It's crazy, right? Yeah, it's it's mind boggling, but that happened, and Zach was. Perfect, it it uh, happened with Ted Bundy. It happened with Charlie Manson. And yeah. that, it's yeah. interesting. I mean, that's a whole that's a whole other rabbit hole we could go down yeah. uh, another time. Because, but and we're not tonight. But yeah. uh, about how 
people that become I that I become iconic for the most fucked up reasons <laughs> <laughs> and, and have people follow them in a way. But I want to get into a, another thing. I, I mentioned the fact that you know you're head of acting and directing at OSU, and that is taking your craft and giving back and teaching. But one thing that we talked about a long time ago, not that long ago, a, 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 few, a handful of years ago, you told me when this was just starting, yeah. um, the Shakespeare and Autism Project. Yeah. Um, tell us about that and, and, and what that entails because as far as giving back, yeah. I, I, have a, I have a handful of questions I wanna ask about that. But tell us basically what the project is yeah, so, and then I wanna <clears throat> ask some deeper questions. Yeah, so the project is, uh, like in a in a nutshell, it started in 2011. We were in the middle of a uh, OSU was in the middle of a partnership with the Royal Shakespeare Company, right? And one of the lead actors of the Royal Shakespeare Company was a woman named Kelly Hunter, and Kelly, uh, phenomenal. I mean, a force of nature, theater artist as a as a as a an actor and a director and, a, and an educator. And she had been doing work with kids with autism in London for a few years and wanted to expand that. We obviously wanted to use uh, this partnership to bring it over to the States. And we have, uh, OSU's theater had uh, outreach infrastructure already. Um, so she met with, uh, uh, I was a grad student at, the po at that time and uh, there was a woman named Robin Post who was a visiting uh, assistant professor and uh, this woman Leslie Ferris who was a professor. So Kelly met with them and they partnered with the Nysonger Center, which is the institute at OSU that studies developmental disabilities. Right. So Mark Tasse is the director there and they decided that they would have this art and science collaboration, which is kind of groundbreaking in the fact that we uh, would play these uh, drama games using Shakespeare's text that Kelly Hunter created. Uh, to see if they were effective in helping kids with uh, their social and communicative skills. And the Nysonger Center would do the research. They would do the testing and the follow-up and, and gather all the data to see if this was like an actual uh, effective intervention. And that's what we did for two years. From 2012 to 2014, we went into uh, Ridgeview Middle School and Winterset Elementary once a week and we played these games with these kids. And you know it was uh, it was a transformative experience because uh, had you had any experience with children with autism? Prior no, to that? zero, zero. And I, had, and I had almost no experience with Shakespeare, except I mean I, I had studied Shakespeare in college, but I sure. never performed it until 2010 when we did a fellow at OSU, mm -hmm. and um, and Kelly Hunter's she came over to do just regular Shakespeare workshops with my MFA cohort. And that's how we met. And then she saw me in uh, Bengal Tiger at the Baghdad Zoo at Catco. Which would be one of those roles and, that you've done here in Columbus. Which, where, and then she I asked me to join amazing. Yeah, yeah. to be one of the teaching artists. Yeah. And you know, she and I just hit it off. And we did that. We did, that was the, the main pilot project. And the capstone was we did an adaptation of The Tempest uh, at the Royal Shakespeare Company uh, that Kelly adapted. And... It wasn't, a, you know how you have sensory friendly performances mm -hmm. that are the kids watch? Right. This was not that. This is a, a performance of The Tempest with kids with autism. So six actors sit around this floor cloth and with a new group of kids, every performance, we tell the story of The Tempest and the connective tissue are these games. And it's, it's astounding. I mean, you watch kids transform right in front of your eyes over the course of 85 minutes. And, 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 that's and awesome. why do you think you know, that when you look at, at, at theater pieces that are, are available to, to accomplish this goal, why do you think it was Shakespeare? Why, why does Shakespeare translate in, in, into being so effective? Yeah, Shakespeare is, uh, Shakespeare, because A, it's iambic pentameter, right? Which okay. Which is the rhythm of a heartbeat. So iambic pentameter is just like ba-boom, 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 ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom, five of those, right? right. So it's the rhythm of the heartbeat, and that's arguably like the first sound we encounter even before we're born. And so we can all kind of really connect to that in an organic way. So there's the rhythm of that language, plus these vivid characters, right? So in The Tempest, you have this wizard, Prospero, 
and Caliban, who's like half fish, half monster man. And so these vivid characterizations that help unlock these uh, inner worlds that kids with autism have rich inner imaginative yeah, worlds, absolutely. just like anybody. Yeah, yeah. But expressing that, sort of putting words to feelings and getting it out is what is difficult for a lot of those kids. So Shakespeare seems kind of uniquely qualified in heightening the circumstances with the rhythm was, of the language. Was that an accident that, that they that they happened upon Shakespeare and how it connects with autism? Or was well, it or was it actually like I think this might work with kids yeah, with autism? I think it was Kelly went to do um, a Shakespeare workshop with prisoners in, in London and she had just finished doing As You Like It as a as a tour, so she basically had the whole play memorized. But she um, she uh, made photocopies of scenes and monologues and all the stuff. And she like reams of them. And she went into the prison and like ten minutes into the workshop, she realized none of them could read. Oh wow! So she was like, "What?" She never hesitated. She just threw all that out and started to improvise games with smaller chunks of text and taught these guys. And then she got the idea that maybe this could work for autism with kids with autism. Yeah. And she was right. Hmm. Uh, um. I, I, yeah, I think that's and and it's still going on as we speak. It still goes on now. So yeah. how has it changed you? Well, uh, well, how's it? I mean, dude. Uh, it's, you know, uh, let, yeah. let me let me let me let me let me let me. I don't. Not that you need help with yeah. this, but uh, you know, some twenty years ago, I got involved with uh, with with folks from Down syndrome. I didn't know a lot yeah. about Down syndrome yeah. until friends of mine had a baby that had downs and they asked me to be part of this uh buddy walk that happened yeah. that, that was in franklin park with yeah, yeah. at that particular point yeah. you know a couple hundred people at the most and i learned more about downs and the families and downs and then my eyes were opened and i learned more about it and as i was going through that and, learning, and since then i'm a huge advocate uh, for the down syndrome association yeah. but i remember i remember in that process somebody coming up to me this is mm, five to ten years ago talking about autism and and there wasn't a whole lot of discussion ten years ago about kids with autism and 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 how to how to help them or develop them or so but now once again the word is out there so you know you coming into it like you said you knew nothing about at that particular time, not not yeah. not nothing, but yeah. not involved. Yeah. How has it how has it changed you and shaped you now that you've seen these kids transform yeah. as a result of this program? Well, it, it what was interesting when Kelly asked me to do it, she tells the story that she was convinced that I would say no, because I was. Did you think about saying no? No, I was. I was like, wow, this woman who I whose work I admire so much uh, is asking me to be part of this new project and I I was terrified by it and I figured well all right if yeah. it's terrifying I should probably do it <laughs> if it scares you I wasn't go a, for it yeah. wasn't an autism expert obviously no, no. and I wasn't a Shakespeare expert so I, I walked into the first workshop like do I have the do I have the goods to, to like do I have the right to help be here trying to help these kids and in that first workshop we do this thing it's called the heartbeat hello that's how we start every workshop and the instant we did that Something happened to me uh, that I just kind of like relaxed. I re something released because I, I become that. To an extent, even though we talk about the the work that I've gotten to do, there are yawning stretches where the phone doesn't ring. Right. And I had become that guy to an extent, waiting for the phone to ring. And in those moments, you ask yourself, "Why am I still an actor? Like, what to what end?" And this reminded me of why I love theater, acting, arts. Do what you do. And then over that 60 minutes, I watched kids who had all this armor, right? Like scales that fell off. To shreds down. Yeah. It falls and off. so it's, it's one of those situations where if we say the, uh, like the pure form of art is we all leave better than when we came in for having had this experience. Everybody does, right? right? Then that's what this was. Because I was, I was like, this is incredible. And it's great acting training, too, mm -hmm. because you have to, if you want a situation where you have to adjust, 
Right. Just walk into yeah. a room with eight kids with autism because you don't know what's going to happen. No. You just don't know. And that's kind of thrilling and terrifying. And then you have to adjust, right? And everybody's got to work sure. as an ensemble. Sure. And it's, uh, it's addictive because you feel like, okay, I'm given something and I'm getting something. How, re equal measure. how rewarding is the, uh, the, is the when you see it when you see it actually work and be successful? I mean, well, it's rewarding for us to to the point of being moved. Moved, yeah. And then you watch the parents because uh, in a lot of the workshops or the performances, the parents are, are, they, there, are, they, are they amazed? And they, they they say, "I've never seen my son sit exactly. still for exactly. sixty minutes. I've never right. seen my daughter speak this clearly in public." Exactly. Wow. wow. I mean, and. How do you you, yeah. you you can't put a you can't put an emotional price on that. You can't now. Now my daughter is trying harder to make friends in school. Right. Like we get reports back three months later, and it's and it's incredible. It's incredible. And one of the things we talked about was um, we were doing that pilot project because it wasn't part of the research. Was mm -hmm. uh, does it last? Like does this these gains that they're seeing do they last? Because at the end of that two years, we did the last workshop and it was like. Was over yeah you know we we needed some sort of closure but the kids didn't they just like picked up their bags and took off and we were left like what what was that and i i did a ted talk a, like a year and a half ago about this and i told the uh told the same story so if you saw the ted talk you can like go you know, <laughs> grab a snack right I, now listen to this I, podcast i don't instead. have i don't have that on your list of credits i don't have ted yeah, talk right. out here but uh nine months after that uh research project there maybe 10 months I was uh, at the Whetstone Rec Center mm -hmm. with Cav, my son, and we were just playing on the playground, and there was an occupational therapy group there, and one of the boys in the group was part of our group in Shakespeare and Autism, and I hadn't seen him in 10 months, and I was like, this is my chance to see if yeah. he has any did, recollection. Did it stick? And I walked over to him, and I was super nervous. I was like, oh, this is unbelievable. This is like a moment. And I said, hey, man, do you remember me? And he looks at me, he's like, Shakespeare, hello, hello, and Cav, Cav's like, Dad, what's wrong? And I was like, nothing's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> he said hello. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, getting teary. I'm mess. getting awesome. teary. I'm getting teary. Listen to I the. I was a mess. And then, the, oh yeah, Cav hell and I, yeah. Cav and I start playing tag on the playground, and every time uh, oh, man. we walk by him, he oh. does another. Uh, he does another line from one of the games we played. He remembered every single game, and it was. It was astounding. Wow! It was one. Of, it was one of the greatest moments. Uh, there you I, go. I've, I've had as a as an art professional, I guess. That's awesome. That is terrific. As a human, really. Yeah. I mean, it's, it was uh, incredible. Uh, uh, it's amazing. That's amazing. And Good we've for heard you. those anecdotes, you know, time and time again from all kind, you know, parents, yeah. and educators, and stuff. Yeah. And it, and the program continues as the we. Program speak. continues. It's now part of the. It's been part of the OSU curriculum. So every spring. Ah. We have um, OSU students, grad students and undergrads can enroll in that. And for the first five weeks, they learn the games and they mm -hmm. research autism and best practices. And in the last 10 weeks, we do workshops twice a week with kids. That's so cool. Is it just acting students or is there no, other it's students amazing. as well? It's, uh, we've had uh, we, most of the people have some sort of impulse toward performance. Sure. So we've had uh, pharmacy majors, astrology majors, grad students from the dance department, uh, Psychology majors and theater majors. Sure, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So, well, I can't think of uh, a better note to close on yeah. than that. I mean, as an actor, you know, on stage or on film, you give of yourself, your talent. But when you get an opportunity to give back, yeah. In this particular case, with this program, and also as a professor, because you're teaching, and you know. I mean, that's that's a that's a whole different reward of, of a different kind. That's not accolades for a great performance. No, no. that's not an award. Thank you so much. I want to thank the academy. Yeah, yeah. This is something that that I think is far more rewarding on a whole different level. Like food it, for the soul. Almost. It is, yeah. and, it, and, it, and it it sort of leads us to other things. Like we have a we have a Shakespeare and Veterans Initiative that we've had for over the last year and a half. Okay, that we do that. We. Uh, if it works there, well, can, maybe it'll work here. Well, it's different. It's like, yeah, different yeah, approaches. Different approach, but yeah. But we, had, we did this thing very quickly. We did this thing um, 
where we did Shakespeare workshops with combat veterans and active duty personnel on Tuesdays, and then uh, military family members and VA counselors on Thursdays. Because like this one is kind of something that you may have heard of from other arts organizations. They provide arts opportunities for veterans. But the family members and the VA counselors, their, their needs kind of get back burner just out of necessity. Right. But the, the need to like communalize your experience and be heard and, and just find another way of processing your experience, man, it was, it was incredible. It was incredible uh, the stories that you hear just by doing a scene from Julius Caesar. Right, because now you have an aesthetic distance. We're not asking you to tell us about like the worst day of your life. Right, you're just doing a scene from Shakespeare, and in the process of doing that, stuff comes up. And it all yeah, and it was up and shows yeah. itself. So it's uh, so we're gonna we're gonna start doing the uh, reason I brought we're gonna start doing those in June. Again. Uh, you know, I I probably have another. 40 minutes of things I can get yeah, into but yeah. we'll save it for another time yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. save it for another episode time episode 2 uh, Hansberry I'm gonna make you proud of me and wrap it up before a minute and 15 how about that an Whoa. hour and Whoa. An wow. hour and 15 <laughs> an hour and 15 <laughs> an hour and 15 <laughs> an hour quickest 15. episode ever uh, no not the quickest episode <laughs> ever but uh, I wanna thank Kevin McClatchy has been our guest bravo yeah, well yeah, done thanks, well, take a bow awesome. take a bow the guest bottle uh, real quick what'd you think of Whiskey War Whiskey War is Whiskey Crazy. War, it's good. really good. Eighty-six good. proof, really a high good. ride content, a blend really of some straight whiskeys. Uh, thank you to uh, High Banks Distillery. You guys are putting out a great product. I know you put out some other fine liquors as well, but I'm glad you're into the brown liquor as well. Hansberry, quickly, uh, anything else you want to say before we close? Yeah, rate and review us on the iTunes, please, and thank you. Share with your friends your acting friends your uh liquor degenerate friends like us yes you know, anybody that you i don't i don't know like if you this. have any liquor degenerate friends i know you have Wait, acting friends what about so actor totally into, uh, alcoholics yeah that's our target know, audience if you want to send one. this to malkovich or efron or yeah, jim right. parsons or and lily like, collins or lily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah hansbury has got a little yeah. crush on her i don't have a little crush she was lovely uh, uh, our guest. Go well, ahead, hold on. Man. Let me just finish real quick on the social media. It says subscribe on YouTube, uh, Whiskey Business with Dino Tripodis. Yes, come on. We need one more subscriber. We had 99 uh, followers come at on. the beginning of the episode. YouTube is fairly new to us, so if we crack 100, we'll feel like we're moving on. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitters, and uh, yeah, like we said, there she is. Uh, oh, oh, come on, Kevin. Is that a picture with you? Yeah. It's a picture All right, with give me, Lily. Give me, give me. I'm going to show her. Right. Right. Yeah, 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 on, if you follow us on YouTube, you'll see a picture oh. of Kevin and Lily. Uh, oh, you're both. You're both lovely. She is uh, one of a kind, man. Yeah, she she's great. Fantastic. She was great. I, 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 I did not mean to leave her out of all the praise and so forth and so on because she obviously was an essential to the success of that yeah. uh, that film being as good as it is. But you know that scene where she walks down the hall, slumps against the wall. Yeah. yeah. Eight takes of that. Eight takes Flawless. of that. Wow. Every for, time for a variety of you know maybe technical adjustments. Flawless. Where she's asking Ted to tell him, and tell when, her the yeah, truth. She and, walks yeah, out and yeah. when, once he, uh, when, once it's after he writes, I'm not going to say what he yeah. writes in the spoilers. Was, uh, I'm not going to say. It was, uh, it was deeply impressive watching her work. She was great. Cool. So that's cool. So you still get, you still get impressed. You still get to watch people and, and, and yeah, still, man. you know, you teach, you direct, but you still get to watch people and go, wow, absolutely. Yeah. So you're yeah. still learning. Yeah. I, how can you not? How can you not? No, no that's one, the beauty of the craft. Nobody right? reads. It's not like it's like you don't reach the end of the internet. No, man. you don't reach the end of, of acting. You just no. keep, you keep you going. Keep learning. Yeah. All right. Our, well, last thing here. Here, Kevin, take <laughs> that. Good. There we go. Okay. Vote. <laughs> can, can we do this on hard stock next time? <laughs> I, you know what? I did it last <laughs> minute. Columbus. I'm really sorry that I'm <laughs> such a loser. <laughs> Thanks, oh, John's man. wife, too, for that. Uh, That's right. Uh, my, Jen, my wife. Uh, how could you Jen. not vote for guys that Come use on. scotch tape and, and, and computer paper? To, I asked him, I was like, don't you have like the technology to put this on the screen? I put it together with Band-Aids, for God's sake. I'm a tenured professor. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what you have for me. <laughs> <laughs> DIY Whiskey All right. Business I gotta wrap this up uh, Whiskey Business my friends is a Never the Luck production produced on the audio side by the son I never wanted Greg Hansberry <laughs> and of course uh, the brilliant uh, director producer John Whitney Thumbs who indulges us with his awesome. presence each and every week 
And our very special guest, Kevin McClatchy. Man, thank you, man. Yeah, man. I hope you had a great time. I had a blast. I hope you had a good time doing this. Uh, I'm I'm glad we finally worked it out. I know you're a busy man between teaching and family and and, and acting with Zach Efron and John John Malkovich. It's Zach. It's Zach. And Lily Collins and so forth. (laughs) So we're we're, we're thrilled that you got to be here. I, I, I don't mean to sound patronizing or... But I'm really, I've been wanting to do this one for a while. Yeah, me too. I mean, I really, and I'm really glad, and I, and I think it went out. great. So thank you, my friend. Yeah, man. Um, and uh, until the next bottle, see ya. Sweet. Awesome, dude. Sweet. That was great. <laughs>